Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, from someone who's always, you know, never been near the box. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, I've had the opportunity at Canterbury to see some great hockey games, boys hockey and girls hockey, and some great baseball games. I've been a, a proud uncle of a couple of Canterbury students, so I want to say thank you for including me in your town hall. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, the subject that I want to talk about today is an international perspective on what we all have in the United States, by which I mean the right to vote. And through that right, the ability to help shape our government and to participate in our democratic process. The background that I bring to this is, I, you know, you might say I'm sort of, by vocation, I'm a democracy activist. Uh, I spent, and uh, that came from spending about seven years overseas working with an organization called the National Democratic Institute, which uses USAID assistance money to help countries that are starting new democracies make sure their, their elections are free and fair, help to train new parliaments, uh, help to provide technical support to uh, political parties, civic organizations, help with constitution writing. And I was involved in programs doing that in several countries in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Indonesia. Uh, before that, I was in the Peace Corps in, in, in West Africa. Uh, I now you know, am based in the United States and have a kind of investment job as my main thing, but I, democracy is sort of my extracurricular activity. And I do that through an organization called Common Cause, which is active on things like uh, efforts to amend the Constitution, efforts to make sure government is more transparent, more accountable, and I'll talk about a couple of those things as we move on. So the, I want to start with a question kind of to see how on their toes people are here. Uh, this is a slide with four pictures of four distinct moments in time. Who can tell me what these four pictures have in common? What is happening in all four of these pictures? I'll give you, I see one hand, ten of hand, but I'm give a hint to help more people kind of recognize it. These people look sad. <laughs> they look sad. Go ahead. What do you think is happening here? Somebody's getting elected. Who's not getting elected? These four people, right? So these are concession speeches is kind of the term that gets used. These are the moments when uh, former President Jimmy Carter on the top left, former President George Bush here, John McCain here, and John Kerry address the nation. And what are some of the things that they say? This is usually election night, sometime around 11 o'clock, midnight, and it's going to happen on November 6th. Either Barack Obama or Mitt Romney will be making the same kind of speech. What are some of the kinds of things that get said? Any, if anyone's seen one of these kinds of things or, yeah? Uh, I appreciate all those who voted for me. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, they say that and they almost always say, I just called my opponent and I congratulated him and we agreed to mend the divisions in our country and I agreed to support him and I accept the verdict of the ballot. Now, some might say, you know, ho-hum, you know, this is standard, these are speeches, the guy's got to say this. But I want us to stop and look at this picture and look at what really, get, really happens when people like that say that. The two people on the left, President Carter and President Bush, who were they? What were their titles? On, they were President of the United States. What's another title that they had? Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army, which is the most powerful in the world. So think about this. These two people, at the moment they said, I accept, I'll walk away from power, were the most powerful people on the planet. Uh, so what we have, one of the things that we have through the election and through voting is the ability that the people in power are subservient to the will of the people. A, a words on a piece of paper, the Constitution, and the results of the election are what shape what the people in power do. Now, let me ask you, is that, are there examples that we might think of where that's, that's not the case? Are there people who uh, perhaps weren't so willing to, to leave power? Anyone can think of any in, in different countries around the world, yes? Cote d'Ivoire, Hafoy Boigny, very good. One of the longest serving uh, dictators, military dictators uh, in history. Um, and, well, I have a, point it here. I have a, uh, a rogues gallery here of some of the most famous dictators of recent years. Hafoy Boigny is not on here, but he could have because he served for quite a long time. Um, 
going through some of these folks. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi on the upper left served in power for 42 years as brother leader and guide of the revolution in, in Libya. Uh, and because he did not accept the will of the people, did not accept the democracy, the only way that a transition could happen in that country was through civil war. Suharto, 30 years. Fidel, Fidel Castro, 49 years. Passed on power to his brother. Uh, Mobutu, Seseko, and Zaire. Look at that outfit. Pretty wild. Uh, now, one of the things, what happens when people stay in power for a long time? Do they get weirder or do they get more normal? Weird. Really, really weird. Some of these people do some amazingly bizarre things. I'm going to talk about this handsome man on the beautiful purple, uh, blue sofa here, Nyasing Bey Yadamba, who was the dictator of a country where I was in Peace Corps and where I did some of this pro-democracy work. Uh, he was in power for 38 years. The Shah of Iran, the Shah is kind of like a king. This is rather than a dictatorship, it's more of a monarchy. Uh, and we all know that he was over, only overthrown through a revolution. Um, this one guy up on the right, he was, didn't serve as long, only eight years, but I put in, him in because he had such a great title. His Excellency, President for Life, Field Marshal, Idi Amin Dada, Lord of the Beasts of Earth and Fishes of the Sea. You like that? Now, um, there's another notorious democracy, uh, um, dictator I've not included um, that I thought we, we, should, oh, we should reference here. <laughs> This is His Excellency Sultan Jeffrey Ben Franklin Johnson, dictator for life of history and master of all chalk dust. <laughs> now, um, the, the previous slide mentioned civil wars as something that often happens in uh, countries where there isn't this agreement that we saw in those first four images to accept the will of the people as expressed by a vote. <laughs> We all know the United States has had its civil war. You're familiar <coughs> with that from history. Can people name other countries that have uh, suffered uh, with civil, civil war? Can people name other civil wars in recent history? <coughs> Spain. Spain, Spanish Civil War. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, others? Yep. The Dominican Republic. Excellent. Another uh, very brutal internal war. Um, let me ask you, do, you, do people think uh, over in recent history, which has been more common, civil war or in, interstate war, war between different countries? Who would say interstate? Raise your hand. War between countries. Do people have hands? Do we leave our hands behind? We've got some. We got a couple hands. Who would say civil wars have been more common? Okay. Sultan, you have trained your servants well. Would you move that, the slide on, please? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, digest this, this graphic on the right. What does it say? You have to sort of look at the... Can everyone read it? How does that graph work? This is a quick... Uh, who, can, who can explain what that graph is telling us? Anyone want to volunteer? You need to just quick read. Yeah. It's graphing the total number of wars to, uh, and breaking it down into societal warfare and that's right, and, and societal warfare would include what? Civil war, Civil war ethnic war. insurrections, uh, other kinds of internal um, warfare. And this is a graph of three, there have been 326 episodes of armed conflict since World War II. The red line is the number of those conflicts that have been between two countries, interstate, the blue line is the, the number that have been within a country, and the yellow line is just adding the two together. So you're correct. The answer to the question is that civil war has been much more common. And civil war is one of the outcomes of the absence of, of voting as a means to transfer power. Um, now, kind of for total extra super points, um, who, can, who has a theory about why? I mean, there's good news here, right? Look at the, the number of wars just dropped. Bang. The total number of wars. Everyone see that? How it goes down after that's 1991. Who has a theory for what happened in 1991 that might explain that dropping off? I've got one hand here. Think for a second. Anyone else? Before I call? Yeah, go ahead. Um, didn't the Berlin Wall come down? Yes, that's exactly. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989, but a related event happened in 1991, which was the end of the Soviet Union and effectively the end of the Cold War. And remember that the Cold War, the United States versus the Soviet Union, 
both sides tended to, to provide arms and money to warring factions uh, in the confrontation around the world between the supporters of communism and the supporters of, of capitalism. So one thing this graph shows is you guys live in a better time than, than previous time. Was there a question back here? Any questions about, about what we've talked about so far or comments about what we've talked about so far? The bottom left graph, the global map here shows the 30, uh, the, as I mentioned, there were 30, 326 episodes of armed con conflict, excuse me, and the bottom left shows where those conflicts are, are active now. Um, okay, let's see where I want to go next. Okay, uh, hold on, I wanted to ask this as a question. Well, I kind of gave it away, but, so we had a picture of those dictators who refused to accept the, the will of the people, who refused to relinqu relinquish power. And we had a picture, on the other hand, of the Democrats who abide by the rule of law, abide by the Constitution, which has been more common in, in history. If you think de the Democrats, raise your hand. If you think it's the dictators and the monarchs, raise your hands. Some people have their hands. And yes, that is correct. Again, good training of your servants. This is a graph of the growth of democracy in the world, 1800 to 2003, using a 10-point score. There are, a lot of diff there are a couple of different organizations that try to rate countries by how democratic they are. I'll be talking, don't worry too much about the details of it, but these are countries that score eight or higher uh, on that scale. Um, any reactions or comments about what you see there? Is that impress anyone? Does that seem noteworthy to anyone? Not noteworthy? Nothing interesting is happening here? Back in the back row. It goes down in 1940. Yeah. Who has it? Who can, there's one word that can help explain that. World War II. World War II well, I was actually thinking of a different word. <laughs> Fascism. And it, it goes down, actually it starts to go down before 1940 when there was the beginning of a movement to really question a lot of existing democracies in Europe and elsewhere began to question, well, why let people vote? People don't get it. Let the, the leaders know better. You know, Mussolini, who took over Italy in, when was it, 32? I don't remember exactly. You know, we don't, I'm going to make the trains run on time by myself. I can do it better than a democracy. And a lot of people fell into that ideology. In the United States as well, there were a lot of people, because remember, the Depression had just happened. And the Depression seemed to be such a failure of the existing systems. So that's a very good observation that there was that dip in democracy since then. And any other, any other reactions to this, to this uh, slide? Yes? There was a spike after the Cold War. Spike after the Cold War, that's exactly right. Um, the other reaction that I feel in looking at this is almost hallelujah. Look at this. If we stretch that line back in history, how far would it go? To basically the beginning of human civilization. There'd be a little bump for Greece, a little bump maybe, arguably, for some of the Renaissance city-states in Italy, maybe, depends how you define it. You could go back tens of thousands of years, no democracy, and then all of a sudden, this is freedom spreading throughout the world. And it's going to have an, it has had and will have an amazing impact. You don't know it, but on your lives and this country and the rest of the world. Um, another way of looking at that gave the number of countries that are Democrats. This graph here using a different scale. This is an organization called Freedom House. And I think I'll tr I, I was able to send some of these links to the, but you, I think you should be able to see, see and play around with uh, different websites that have the links and have these scoring and that kind of thing. This is a different organization called Freedom House. And this asks the question not how many countries are de democracies, but what percentage of the population of the world lives under democracies. Uh, and you can see the blue is multi-party democracy, which increases to, according to Freedom House, up to about 60% by 1997, which is how far I could get this, uh, find a, a good graph for this system. Um, one of the things that declines a lot is the, the uh, traditional monarchy, which, remember, was very common back in, particularly in Europe. But now, there's a little bit left as a curiosity. There's one country, there's maybe more than one, but one country in particular that's still a traditional monarchy that's very important in the world, particularly as regards important natural resources. 
Can anyone guess what I'm talking about? Yeah? Bingo. Very well done. It's a, it is nowhere near a democracy uh, and, and is, a, um, is a traditional monarchy. Um, okay, so that looks at, at the, the change in, in the, um, under various political systems. This is taking that 100 year span, we went to 200 year span, then the 100 year span, and this looks at sort of roughly the last 30 years, a time period that's called often the, th the third wave of democracy. Um, again, I want you to, uh, well, take a look at this and tell me things that you see, things that strike you. Any, any comments or thoughts? Yeah? There's only, that one shows three communist states left, but they make up a large percent of the population. And, uh, and, and what country accounts for most of that? China. China. 1.2 billion. Yeah, good point. Um, other comments? Were you going to say something? <laughs> Careful with that pen. I'll call on you. Then you... <laughs> yeah? South America went from very little democracy to, like, pretty much all. Yes, and that's a very interesting uh, development because... That, if you would ask the academics, the professors who study political science in the late 60s and 70s, if you ask them, well, you know, where is democracy feasible or possible? You know, what are some of the preconditions for democracy? You would have had some tell you it really only works in Protestant countries. You may have covered in, in history the, the Weber thesis. Um, the Protestant work ethic, and there's a, there was a theory that Catholicism is too hierarchical, too authoritarian, and look, the Latin American countries, which are mostly Catholic, none of them are democracies, and you'll also notice that, let me get my pointer, here, 1970s, there's still two countries in Europe, three countries in Europe with Greece, that are autocracies or military juntas, Spain and Portugal. Uh, so there was a belief that, no, nah, democracy can't, but that, um, it's the third wave of democracy really began with an overthrow of the military dictatorships in, in uh, Spain and Portugal in 1974 and 75, and then spread into Latin America. Now, one thing to note is there is an ebb and flow. So this map shows Venezuela as a democracy. We'll find it's now kind of receded. So there are some countries that go backwards, although the general trend is going forward. Um, one other point that it, so the, a, a big change here, huge change here, look at the comparison. So this is both Russia, and we'll talk about this in a minute, in Central Eastern Europe. One case I like to talk about is right here, this is the Philippines. And the organization that I was working with, the National Democratic Institute, played a big role in monitoring that election. And it was the first time, really, that foreigners were kind of invited in to see if an election was fair. And the organization helped to train tens of thousands of volunteers who, the, Fernando Marcos was the, Ferdinand Marcos was the dictator at the time, and the fear was that he would, uh, you know, let people vote, but then he controlled the election apparatus, and when you aggregated the numbers from all the individual polling stations, he would just add a few zeros on this column and take a few zeros on that column, and now he, And so they did something called a parallel vote count, where they kept their own copies of, the, they watched the count, kept their own copies, and kept that separate. It was an, an incredible mobilization of people uh, who had to stand up to soldiers to do this, and gave rise to the notion of people power on how people power could protect elections and resulted in the Philippines de being a democracy, which it is today. Um, how am I doing my time? Okay, all right. So, so that sort of uh, changes from that time period. I'm going to go now, I think, if I remember my order of my slides. Let's see what my slides are. Okay, so this just jumps up. Here we were in 1970s. I just gonna want to briefly jump up. Now, the colors are different because this uses a third different index, and I'm sorry to use different indices, but I couldn't find things that covered all the same time. This is uh, the economist indices. This is green is good as opposed to blue being good. Um, but I just wanted to bring you up to 2010. Um, one quick note, Any, who wants to guess which country ranks the highest in the world on democracy according to uh, this particular bunch of scholars? In back. Canada. Close. It's actually Norway. Norway gets a, a, a 10 out of 10 in this scale. Um, okay. So I want to go now to some sort of case, any questions at this point? I'm, what I'm going to go now is to some particular case stories about the struggle to vote and how people have gained the vote in different parts of the world. But before I go into that, any questions sort of about the big picture stuff and the, and the uh, trajectory that we've been mapping out? Is this surprising or interesting? Yeah. Sort of, none of the above. Yeah? 
main reason why we vote is to, you know, cho choose our government, you know, for a better economy. But, um, you know, it seems as if, you know, for example, it seems as if Canada, economically, is, it, you know, right now is, you know, more successful than that. Well, why is it? Why is it? Wait, why is Canada a better economy than... What, what, so why, why is Canada more uh, rated higher in democracy? Is that what you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, different organizations will, will do this in different ways. Some of the variables that get included are degree of participation, right? Which is something that I, uh, I think your teachers have been talking a lot about here. And so turnout, countries that have higher turnout score higher on this... On this uh, on this indice. Another variable is the ability of third parties, multiple parties, more than just two parties, to win seats. And that has to do with how the votes are counted. We'll get to that in a second. There are, uh, another element is respect for human rights. And I think the United States, which you can see is a little bit lower than some of the other countries, gets dinged here for Guantanamo Bay and for torture. Um, so uh, those are some of the elements that, that, uh, that get included. Any other reactions, questions to what we've covered so far? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk now about the Central, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the, we talked, touched on this a little bit before, but the, the map on the top, this is Central and Eastern Europe in 1989. Um, most of you remember, who can give me a quick, how did all of that turn red? Yeah. World War II. World War II. And what happened in World War II? Let's have someone else. What happened in World War II to, to make all that red? Someone who hasn't spoken before. Let's get some more people in, involved. Does someone else want to tell me who has, do you want to say? You had your hand up? Yeah, you can say, yeah. No? You were just flicking. Anyone else who hasn't been talking want to say what happened in World War II to, to make this, this red? Yes. Hitler. Hitler, and, and who fought against Hitler? Yeah. The Soviet Union. Well, it, it, the allies, the Western allies, the US, France, England, etc., fought from, uh, approaching from the West and from the East, the Russians. And the Russians rolled all the way into Germany, uh, which was a great thing because they really were the key for Hitler being defeated. But they didn't stop. They, they did not bring their tanks back into Russian territory. And as soon as the war ended, they basically set up control of what became called the Iron Curtain countries. You may remember Churchill making the famous speech about the Iron Curtain going from the Baltic uh, to the Adriatic. Uh, and they took control of all of these countries that previously, many of them had been democracies. The countries in red here, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and they divided Germany. Remember, Germany was divided, and the city of Berlin was divided. And it was divided between a communist side and a capitalist side, and the people who lived in the communist side, how do you think they liked, felt about living in the communist side? They didn't like it. Where they had a repressive police state, where there were spies all over, where their jobs were effectively dictated by a central command. You will make 10,000 shoes. Is there a buyer for 10,000 shoes? Doesn't matter, make your 10,000 shoes. Um, where there were no rights, no freedom of expression, no real freedom of artistic expression, arts. You know, the government decided what you should paint. Uh, so did people like that? What'd they do? They tried to run away, they tried to leave, and for that reason, the Berlin Wall was built right across the middle of the city of Berlin. So imagine New York with a wall right through the middle of Manhattan. The people above, you know, in upper Manhattan, you know, you can't, you can't come down. And that's what, that's what, what, what had happened in Berlin. Uh, and all of these countries were incredibly repressive. There were efforts. There was a, a great human rights community in a lot of these countries that, that tried to tell the world about what was happening, that tried to protest and, and demonstrate and, and begin to uh, forced the governments to give them more rights and these movements had some um, flourishings at different times. One was in 1968 called the Prague Spring uh, and this was a movement in, in the capital of Czechoslovakia uh, to begin to have democracy and it was, there was a huge outpouring of people out in the streets and we can change our country uh, and what happens? The Soviets rolled their tanks into Prague crushing the revolution and effectively making it be another 30 years until there was freedom. But the, uh, the dissidents continued. There was a, a trade union that started in Poland that was one of the real first breaks because communism, you don't need trade unions, right? This is the workers' paradise. How could there be need for an independent trade union? 
But the, 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 the pressure of the, the trade unionists in Poland to ex make the space for themselves, to have that union, was sort of the first kink. Uh, and then gradually, uh, eventually, there was so much pressure against these regimes that in 1989, uh, the whole system kind of fell apart. Uh, and the teachers who were here rem can remember that. And I, th I think in 1988, if people had said to you, you know, the Berlin Wall is going to come down, this division of the world is about to stop, people would have thought you were crazy. This is one of these moments in history that kind of came, my God. And the feeling at that time was as country after country quickly threw off the dictatorship, established their own constitutions, had elections. Many of the human rights leaders became first presidents of their country. Václav Havel being one was really, really exceptional. So the map went from this to this. This isn't colored in with the democracies, but almost all of these countries are now democracies in an incredibly short period of time. And for people living through that experience, it was as though, you know, democracy and freedom and the vote is unstoppable. Um, there was a historian who wrote a book called The End of History at that time because he said history is struggle and we don't need to struggle anymore. It's been proven what's good for man. It's democracy. Now, Im importantly, there was one country where there was a major protest in 1989 that didn't have so much success and it was the country on my opening slide. It was China. Very good. And what hap who can say what happened in China that year, 1989? Yeah. Uh, there, there was students protesting against um, economic reforms to make like because uh, uh, I forget who it was, but anyway. Um, anyway, there were, like a bunch of students protesting, and there was nonviolent protests, and then um, they brought out tanks and stuff, and people were killed, even though they were all completely nonviolent protests. Tiananmen Square, <laughs> where thousands of people were killed. Can you look up this event on the internet if you live in China right now? No. no. Can you look up the word Ferrari right now if you live in China? This is kind of obscure, but there was a recent incident of a son of one of the rich Chinese insiders who driving his sports car ran over a peasant and kept on driving and it was caught on video. But you can't find that because the Chinese government exercises such control uh, over the internet in that country. This picture, we talk about the struggle for the vote and people putting their lives on their line to bring the control of the vote over the people in power. This picture is one of those amazing images um, from that time. Okay, so we talked about Central and Eastern Europe. Um, any questions about that before I want to move on and talk a little bit about Africa? And we go to 20 up, right? Um, okay, so uh, I was, I'm going to tell you very quickly a story that I experienced in relation to this. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa uh, 1988 to 1990. And when I arrived in my country of Togo, you know, I tried to ask people, what do you think of your country? What do you think of the politics? How oh, they change the subject? You know, how's the weather? Is it going to rain? I guess people don't really care about politics here. I s soon learned out that the real truth was they were afraid of spies. Because I had a friend who, you know, made a passing reference to the president, Ayatama, whose picture we saw, and he was thrown out of the country for talking about the president in a way that he wasn't supposed to. In schools in Togo at that time, all the kids, half the thing they learned was to dance the Ayatama dance. Aizu, Alafi, Ayatama, you had to praise this dictator. And this was one of the things that was a central part of the curriculum. So it was kind of the complete classic a African dictatorship when I, when, at the beginning of my Peace Corps time. Amazingly, in Africa, as poor and kind of uh, sort of isolated as it was, there was almost an immediate connection to what happened here in Central and Eastern Europe. The people had the radios, they heard what was going on, and almost immediately there was a beginning, beginning of a democracy movement. Political parties started, uh, independent trade unions started, independent newspapers started, there were protests, there were strikes. Uh, foreign pressure started to be put to bear, uh, and the dictator said, okay, I'll back off, uh, we'll have a constitution, I'll allow for elections. Um, but one of the problems here in, in this country, as in many countries in Africa, the, this country, Togo, has um, oops, advance the slide. <coughs> has about 30 different ethnic groups, um, and he had made effectively the army be entirely of his um, of his Kabye people. So one of the things, you know, all of his relatives, all of his family, all the people around him, their jobs came from him being in power. 
Uh, and the army didn't want to have elections because they didn't want to integrate the army. And so they started, there, there was a, a sort of a backlash. Uh, one of the main candidates was, there was an assassination attempt. Uh, and when we came in in about 1992 to monitor what was going to be uh, the main elections here, we found an enormous amount of fraud in, in terms of the, how the election was going to be set up. There were protests at that time, and I put the quote here, where some of the pro-democracy people were saying, give me the single ballot or give me death. And this, meant, this referred to uh, a type of voting that they thought would stop the dictator from, from committing fraud. Um, so these were some of the things that I, had, I was experiencing. And just as a, again, a, on a personal side, I went from having looked at all of that flew back to the States and I saw George Bush's concession speech, which is why I put those things up there. And to be honest with you, I broke into tears because I had seen so many people who were willing to die for what I j had just heard George Bush say. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the dictator and his army and his kind of repressive efforts and the fraud uh, prevailed and uh, Togo was still effectively a dictatorship. He ended up pass He died and passed on uh, the position of control to his son, who's still in power. He's served two terms. There is a constitution that has term limits and says, you know, a president can only serve two two terms. And now he's forcing through in, in their Congress uh, a, an amendment to that constitution to allow for more terms. Uh, and just recently, if you look up Togo in politics, you'll find that the women, there's a group of women in Togo who were saying to their men, to their husbands, you stop that amendment to the Constitution or we're having no sex in this house until you do. So that's why I, the, the picture is. So just as another example of some of the things that people, people do uh, in, in the struggle for the vote. Um, so Togo is sort of an unsuccessful story of a democratic transition in Africa. The great successful story is South Africa. Is that, is that a question? No. Uh, excuse me. This, these are pictures of people. Now, the top three pictures, that, that's Nelson Mandela, who you may have heard of down on the lower left. The people in these other pictures, they are, what are they doing? Waiting to vote. Waiting to vote. Why does it matter? Yeah. Because for the first time, they were given the opportunity. First time in the history of South Africa that for blacks to have the right to vote uh, in, 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 2000, in 1994. Uh, apartheid. What was apartheid? You guys would probably remember. I, I, I want to get some other hands. Anyone else who's not raised a hand want to say what? I'm not. Uh, anyone over here? We haven't had many hands over here. What, what was apartheid? Just give it a shot. No? Okay, go, go ahead. Apartheid is like the separation between... Separation, that's exactly right. And it, it, it was the, the national government, the whites were about 15, 18% of the population when they established this in 1948, and they said, we will decide where, uh, the, no, blacks will have no rights, no rights to vote, and no rights to decide where they live. They were put into separate territories. If they wanted to get jobs outside of those territories, because the territories, of course, were not where the economy was active, they had to leave their families behind, go and live in dormitories. Uh, it was a complete, um, you know, a completely repressive regime. The African National Congress was the organization that was established by Mandela and others uh, to begin to, to overcome that, and through a long history, uh, ultimately led to an agreement to have uh, elections. Again, if, if you would live through this, you know, we think of some struggles in the world as being unresolvable. You know, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, for example. You know, you hear it again and again, and you think these people are never, this is never going to end. And South Africa was like that. Before 1994, before Mandela was released, you just, you know, you have a, 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 a white, you have 15% white, 85% black. How are they ever going to agree on how they will share power? Uh, but there was an agreement, and, and that's now quite a successful democracy. Um, okay, I should get going. Uh, a couple of the, I'm going to skip over, well, what, these are some, some pictures I took from other elections in, in, in Africa. I'll mention one thing about Ethiopia, where I spent some time working, helping um, the group that was writing the constitution. And I got to know the guy writing the constitution in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a country of 90 different ethnic groups, some of which are quite westernized, others are effectively nomadic. And he said to me, so here's what my challenge is. Imagine that the founders who wrote your constitution, when they brought the representatives together to debate the constitution, they also had to invite the Mohicans, the Chekasi, the Arapaho, the Sioux, all of the Native Americans. He said, that's basically what we have. 
all of them around the table, and we have an, it, so it makes an incredible challenge to make a constitution that works for this broad diversity of people. Uh, and it's an interesting way of reflecting on our own constitution writing. Um, okay, so one of the things that comes up in all this is, what does it do for people? What does democracy do for people? Uh, and I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but doing some research here, number one is really interesting. 100 million people in the 20th century have died of famine. Zero percent of them in democracies. Set, uh, area number two. Wars waged by democratic countries against other democratic countries, 1900 to the present, zero. D democracies do suffer from civil wars, although at a lower rate than non-democracies, but they do not wage war against other democracies. So food security, peace, corruption, economic growth, human rights, access to information. We talked about the internet a little bit ago. These are all some of the, big, you know, because obviously there is a moral value to all of this, but this slide sort of talks about what are the tangible, practical benefits to people of all of this. Um, Okay, this is the, a quick slide about the Arab Spring, and I put the picture of Bouazizi. Uh, you, some of you may know this story. Um, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi was a fruit vendor in Tunisia, and he didn't have a license for his fruit cart because it's impossible to get a license for a fruit cart. You've got to bribe the guy. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And he went out and he tried to sell fruit. And the government people said, no, and they stole his cart and they treated him with tremendous disrespect. And he had gone through this so many times, and he knew so many other people who had gone through so many times, that what did he do? He lit himself on fire. Himself on fire. And what happened after that? Uh, it started uh, It started the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring has taken the map of democracy in the Middle East here as of 2010, just two years ago, which is all, almost all authoritarian regimes except for Israel, and it has changed it. I don't have a map of it now, but all of these countries, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, are now pretty well advanced in terms of having uh, the vote. Egypt, a 4,000 year old country, for the first time in more than that, 5,000 years, now has a democratically elected president. Um, okay, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about uh, jump from this international perspective back home. Um, because we're, you know, fortunately we're not in a situation where we need to protest, we need to go and form uh, protest movements or, you know, offer our lives to get the vote in our country because we have the vote in our country. Um, but still participation is important and uh, I think the class is going to touch on some of these things a little bit later on, but I want to talk about some of the things that people are doing now and right now around this election that are ways to continue to improve the democracy we have. Because one of the lessons is that Democracy, it's not like, you know, sort of, you grow up and you're grown up and it's done. You know, you're a non-grown up and then you're grown up, it's done. You're a non-democracy and then you're a democracy, it's done. That's not the way it works. It's kind of a continuum. Uh, democracies can always be improved. There are a lot of different ways that votes can, voting can be done. And there's always an effort with different people to be involved to change some of those. So some I've mentioned over here, there are a bunch of, I think you guys have talked about the issue of voter ID laws. And so there's a lot of activity right now, on the one hand, for people who are concerned about fraud, to make sure that there aren't people out voting, and there's an organization called True the Vote, which is a little bit on the right wing on the political spectrum, that is trying to make sure that you know, illegal immigrants don't vote and people don't vote uh, illegally. Uh, on the counter side, there's a concern that some, some people will be, uh, feel intimidated by that and by voter ID laws, and so there's an effort to sort of protect people's rights. So these are people who organize, go out on their own on a volunteer basis to the polls on election day, and they'll be out there on November 6th. Um, another sort of set of activities is around amendments that people think should be made. You know, is our constitution done? Is it fully baked? No, there's always going to be ideas about things that, that can be improved. There's a group of people that want to repeal the 17th Amendment because they, the 17th Amendment says that senators will be directly elected. Remember the Constitution provided for senators to be indirectly elected by the, 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 state, uh, by the state legislatures. And there's a group of people who believe in that sort of theory of an indirect election and think we should go back to that. I think there's evidence that says there's a lot of risk of corruption there, but, uh, but this is a group that's mobilizing to try to create that amendment. Um, 
personally, I've been working on this constitutional amendment, and I'm going to be out at uh, uh, tea stops in my town and, and uh, um, commuter rails giving out these little cards that say, why vote yes on question five. Question five is a ballot question that I organized the signature gathering for to put a question on the ballot in, in Massachusetts that would call for a constitu constitutional amendment to effectively overturn the Citizens United Supreme Court decision. And you guys may be getting to this, but the Citizens United decision says that corporations have First Amendment rights under the Constitution, and therefore they can speak either through their voices, their advertisements, or their, through their money as much as they want. So a corporation can take all of the money that it has, billions of dollars, and go and buy campaign ads that say, don't vote for Joe, he's a jerk. Uh, why am I, well, I'll, I'll let you get into why that might be a problem later. Anyway, we're, we're proposing an amendment that would say that corporations do not have the right, are not entitled to the rights of uh, constitutional rights, uh, and um, that the firm that Congress and the states can, can limit those things. And we're also doing something to change the electoral college, which we don't have time to go into. Uh, any questions? I realize we're just about out of time, but any questions on anything that we've covered here? I think the presentation goes up on the on the lib line. Okay. Sorry not to allow more time for questions. I kind of ran behind here, but thank you all. Thanks for your thoughts and for the special.